All right, folks, welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. And this week we're joined by Steve Cam from nerdfitness.com. Uh, I've been following Steve's work for a long time, I'd say over 10 years now. So really excited to jump in and pick his brain on everything fitness. So Steve, thanks for jumping on today, mate. Connor, it's great to, uh, we were just saying, I'm just, it's, I'm happy to be here, excited to talk about all the things I've done wrong and uh, kind of how <laughs> a lot of this has changed too over the 15 years since I've been started, uh, since I've been doing this. Yeah, I guess a good place to start is, uh, did it always start with Nerd Fitness? Was that the original name and everything that you went with? Yeah, well, so, you know, I, my background, or rather, you know, I, I like to say I was raised by two loving parents and a Nintendo. I grew up playing video games and uh, escaping into books and movies. So I've always been, I've always been a nerd. Uh, it's something that I've I've been always just really proud of. And it wasn't until, you know, I, through high school and college, I started going to the gym and trying to get bigger and stronger. I was the scrawny weak kid and I had almost no, I made almost no progress. Turns out nutrition kind of important. Uh, but I spent six years completely, you know, ignoring how to eat correctly. And it wasn't until after high school and after college that I, I finally kind of figured out like, hey, you need to eat the right way for your goals. And as soon as I did that, my physique you know, within 30 days started to see changes that I hadn't seen in six years of going to the gym, you know, four or five days a week. It's like, oh man, if I made all these mistakes, I wonder if other people have made these mistakes too. So I spent a year and a half, I got you know certified as a trainer. I moved across the country. I got a different job, but I always had this idea in my head of like, I want to help other people not make the mistakes that I've made. And, but there's already a million fitness websites out there. And that was even true back in 2007 or eight when I bought the domain. So I was like, well, what's different about me and what do I do? It's like, well, I'm a huge nerd. I like fitness and I Googled it and nothing popped up. So I just bought nerdfitness.com. I was like, I'll just, I don't know, I'll figure it out later. I'll just start writing articles about Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and, you know, the nerdy things that I love, but also maybe mix in like, here's how to read a nutrition label. Here's how to do a push up. Here's a workout you can do at home. And uh, just kind of since then, it's been a slow, very bumpy journey from I don't know what I'm doing to here I am now 15 years later, where I still don't know what I'm doing, but I'm having a little bit more fun with it. <laughs> Yeah, like when I think about you, you, what you've done, it's very much like that marketing analogy, like blue ocean, red ocean, Um, because a lot of the fitness industry, it's so segmented into like, you're a bodybuilder, you're a bro, and like, it neglects a lot of people. And like, when I, even when I go into, um, you know, mainstream fitness, uh, it's just, I find it quite weird, like, you know, the, the whole bodybuilding scene and uh, off-putting when everyone's like taking selfies and flexing. And, uh, you know, I think most of the population are probably like that as well. Yet it was catered to, you know, the entire fitness industry was very bodybuilding focused. So I think what you guys have done exceptionally well is like, here is a community for people who maybe weren't very athletic growing up or, or whatnot or into video games, and you can get fit and healthy as well. And just cause you're into, like you're a nerd, we'll say, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be fit. So I'd love you maybe to expand on that. Uh, sure. Well, I, I think it, it's funny you you know, mentioning. I think I've I've largely operated outside of the fitness industry as well. You know, the, the um when I when I started, there was no social media. I mean, I guess there was Facebook, but that's really kind of it. It wasn't you know as, as Instagram comes along and now and now TikTok. The the way to get famous often on those platforms is to be really good looking to take your shirt off or to be in skimpy clothing and to do ineffective workouts on camera. Um, and I think for my audience, you know, I, I wouldn't consider myself a gym rat. I don't, I, I kind of nerd out about fitness, but really I'm a nerd who would rather sit on the couch and play video games. I just also know how much better my mental health and my physical health is when I strength train. So I have found a balance between, you know, we'd like to say at nerd fitness, it's exercise and getting fit can be part of who you are, but not at the expense of what you are. Uh, so you still, I still want people to be nerdy. I still want them to read the the comic books or to take their kids to see, you know, Star Wars premieres, but also like, Hey, here's, here's some ways that we can be healthy and fit. I think with nerd fitness, a lot of people 
are sick and maybe intimidated of the Instagram model, or they just have, they have, they, they can't relate in any way to those people. So they stumble across nerd fitness or they read uh, something I've written and they're like, Hey, this guy seems normal. He seems like a relatable human being that is not obsessed with uh, physical characteristics. He's not obsessed with the tiny details. Like he's just te teaching me basic stuff, but he's teaching me in a way that is understandable, enjoyable, and makes me feel like I can do it. So that's what nerd fitness, the community has become. It's a bunch of nerds and misfits and neurodivergent people and people that don't feel like they have a home elsewhere. And they find nerd fitness, they find our Facebook group, they uh, maybe join our coaching program. And they're like, I feel like I have found my new home. I found my people. I get to nerd out about how to eat better, but also I can talk about Dungeons and Dragons for four hours and everybody else will be nodding their heads because they're excited to hear about what's going on in their D and D campaign. Like it's been, it's been really fun to kind of thread the needle and, and find that overlap between where those two communities overlap that tiny bit, that tiny bit is still quite a bit, quite a few, quite a few people. Yeah. And like from a marketing standpoint, you well, like, I, I learned a lot from, say, John Goodman. I think you were on his, uh, you were on, did he interview you for the summit? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So I, I didn't, I didn't hear it, but um, I'm guessing like a lot of what he says is like, find your unique, you know, what makes you weird and, you know, double down on that and you'll attract your, your audience. So you have done that like probably better than anyone out there, it seems. And was that just something that's just organically happened? And uh, now it's like a kind of textbook marketing approach or how did that all come to be? Yeah, I, it's really easy to connect the dots looking backwards. Uh, but I think it was a lot of fumbling around in the dark and trying a whole bunch of stuff and failing at a lot of things and then and then scaling up in one direction and then and then learning that the things that I thought were important to my business or to my health weren't actually important. The things I was neglecting were actually the reasons why things were going as successfully as they were. Uh, it's just, it's one, it's one life lesson after another, and then it's one crack, uh, kick in the crotch after another as well, you know? So you kind of alternate between like, oh, things are great. And then the next day, like things are awful. And I learned so much and I don't know anything. Uh, it's just a, a consistent, uh, education on that front. Um, like I said, I wish, I wish I could say like, it was all planned from the start, but it was literally like, I'm just a nerd that loves playing video games and reading Tolkien and, I, I, I let's maybe I can help some other nerds that like this. And, and then I think the thing I did do well, that maybe, uh, um, you know, I'm finally getting back to after a few years away, but I just put my head down and I wrote, and that was the thing that I love to do the most. And the thing that was where I could express my weirdness the best was just writing. I published two articles a week, every week for like a decade. And those articles are 2000, 3000, 4,000 words full of PubMed studies and references so that people knew that they were getting really science-backed, evidence-based information, but also with like gifts from Harry Potter and, uh, you know, Star Wars memes and stuff to keep people entertained because that was the only way I could write it is if I was still entertained and making myself laugh as I wrote it. Yeah, like, and for people who haven't checked out your website, like you've got some unbelievable articles like even just the recent one i think was from last year like how to find a personal trainer or you know really really in-depth um do you have a writing process like do you write every day or do you have a specific days of the week that you do your writing yeah it's funny i i used to have a process and then nerd fitness grew and we hired a bunch of people and then all of a sudden most of my time was going into management and dealing with employees across different state lines and business. And, and as a result, I was doing almost no, no writing. So the past 18 months has been a, 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 an attempt for me to return to form and, and kind of reorganizing the business so I can get back to doing what I love to do. And that is right. So these days, yes, mornings are generally reserved. I'm making an, ex an exception for you, Connor. Generally mornings are reserved. I don't have a single meeting. Uh, it, actually, there was a good six month span where I had like a meeting once a month. And otherwise, I was like, I'm working on uh, a super secret book shaped project that I can't necessarily talk about yet. But um, I will be able to talk about that at some point this year. Uh, cool. But uh, my mornings are generally reserved for writing where I just make let the team know like I'm unavailable in the mornings. If people want to do podcasts, it's generally in the afternoon and meetings are in the afternoon mornings. It's I get a cup of doesn't matter. It's 
uh, January right now, I'm drinking cold brew coffee that I've made. I just drink cold brew and put on a great playlist and sit down at my computer and try to write anywhere between 500 and a thousand words is like the goal. But as long as I open a document and start writing, like that's the one step I have to take. And anything beyond that is gravy. And generally speaking, once I start and the music is going and I've had a few sips of coffee, the words start coming out and a new idea will form and a new connection will come in and like, oh, that's really interesting. And I'll chase that rabbit hole. So, or chase down that rabbit hole. So it's, it's, uh, I, I try to like clear my schedule and give myself the opportunity so that I have to plant my butt in this chair and write every morning. Um, let's say five, generally five days a week, sometimes six. Uh, but that's pretty much kind of how the writing happens. It's just, it's, it's as boring and unfun as can be. It's just clear the space sit down at my computer and force myself to start typing. As we know, action creates motivation generally and not vice versa. Very cool, mate. And like you've been writing about fitness for a long time. So uh, like how has your maybe approach changed? Are you more habit-based now or were you more, I think you were always like had a very kind of empathetic approach with your writing. Um, but yeah, has your outlook changed at all? Because you've coached a lot of people at this point as well with your online programs. Yeah, absolutely. So I, when I started Nerd Fitness, I was 25, maybe 26. And then I, you know, I lived out of a backpack. I traveled the world. I built like the, you know, that four hour work week, Tim Ferriss, uh, you know, uh, promoted strategy, which is kind of help, what helped me get Nerd Fitness started. Uh and it was like, everybody should strength train. The paleo diet probably makes the most sense because we should eat like our ancestors. And, you know, the, the, that, that made a lot of narrative sense to me. And in 15 years, and now having interacted with so many registered dietitians and, and doctors and, and people with uh, backgrounds in you know, exercise science and, and I've, I've certainly changed my tune. I, I, what I thought, what I thought was important and how I thought I was helping people turned out to not be the case. I think, you know, I think at one point, if, if you Googled, what is the paleo diet, nerd fitness's article on it showed up first for years. And it when paleo was the biggest thing on the planet. And as I dug in more and, and I learned more about metabolic chambers and studying and, and um, you know, the, the actual science of nutrition, I realized like, yeah, the paleo diet works, but it works not because of what cavemen ate. It works literally because it's math and science, like, of course, you're going to consume fewer calories when you're eating mostly vegetables and lean meats and, and foods of that nature. So I've certainly changed my tune on nutrition. Um, I've also, I, I think the empathy aspect of, of this stuff has certainly evolved too. I think in the past, I used to say like, yeah, anybody can do this. Look, I've done it. And it's like, well, maybe, but not everybody is in the same position as you. A lot of people have different genetics. They have three kids and are working two jobs. So, you know, I, I've always kind of poo-pooed the people that say things like, we all have the same 24 hours in the day and you you don't want it hard enough. It's like, come on, man. That's just like unbelievably unhelpful to 99.9% .9 of the population. Like no, the single mom or the single dad does not have the same hours available to them that a 25 year old single guy might have. Like those are just two completely different um, scenarios. So, I, I've I've come around on the nutrition. I've come around on the, you know, I used to be like, everybody should only strength train and you should only use free weights. It's like, whatever gets people moving is an amazing start. Like if, if it's going for a walk, if it's going to Planet Fitness and doing ugly exercises in the purple machines, like whatever it is at, whatever it is that gets you out of your house or just gets you moving in any way is amazing. Like, we know from inertia science again, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. So let's get people moving. Let's get them excited about the idea of exercising. And over time, we can introduce more concepts like, oh, hey, that's really interesting. Maybe we should try this other type of exercise. Or have you considered, you know, have you considered trying a deadlift? Or, oh, interesting. Have you ever squatted before? You know, trying to mix in some of those just basic primal uh lifting exercises that I think can be really empowering for, for, for people of all ages, shapes, sizes, genders, et cetera. So I've, I've certainly learned a lot in 15 years, the things I thought were important, aren't nearly as important. And now 
I'm way more focused on behavioral psychology and the human elements of helping people where they're at and realizing that everybody is busy, everybody's burned out and just providing them with the, here's a workout plan is like 5% of it. The other 95% is helping them figure out how to fit that into the chaos that is their life. Yeah, I'd love to jump into some behavioral psychology with you, mate. Uh, like, I know this is, there's, everyone's different, but like, you must see themes over 15 years. Of co- like, how many people have you coached? You've coached a lot, a lot of people, I'd imagine, at this point. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we have we have a team of uh, 15, 15 coaches at Nerd Fitness. We've probably coached 15 to 20,000 clients in the past seven oh. years. Um and that's one-on-one coaches, clients interacting via our, you know, the Nerd Fitness coaching app, our coaches. There's a coaching uh, Slack channel for our company. And so it's like, there's like a coaching hive mind. And then each coach has their clients. And then each client has, you know, a, a customized workout plan and nutrition strategy and behavioral stuff. So everybody is individualized, but there are definitely some similarities that we see over and over again. And most of our work, honestly, it's like, yes, we can build you a workout program to help you run a 5k. We can build you a workout program to help you get your first handstand. No problem. Yes. We're going to start introducing more vegetables in your diet. Um, I think the similarities are like helping people override probably two mechanisms. And we tell them this like upfront when they join, it's like, welcome to nerd fitness. What are you most afraid of Or like, what are you afraid is going to happen, you know, a few weeks from now? And they're all like, I'm worried that a few weeks from now, things are going to get really busy and I'm going to do what I've always done. And that's to stick my head in the sand or say, I'm too busy right now. I can come back to it later because that's what most people have done. They've tried every diet. It works for three weeks. It's great. And then life gets in the way. And then they take six months off and then like, okay, I'm ready to try again. The schedule is now clear. So for those people, we say, hey, just a heads up. We know this is going to happen three weeks from now. And we know your inclination is to turtle, to to pull yourself into the safety confines of your shell and to say like, I don't have time for this. And instead, we're going to change things now. We're going to do less now. And we're going to build contingency plans so that you know, like almost like a break in case of emergency, you know, glass panel on the wall. When life gets busy, we even built, we built this into the app. You know, if you wake up and your coach has a workout program for you, but your life is in absolute chaos, there's a little button. It's a little dial uh, on the, on the app that you can click. And it's like, this is your, okay. Everything for that day gets scaled back. If it was a full workout, you hit that little button and it says like, great, your new goal for the day is to go for a five minute walk and drink two glasses of water. And like, that's it. You still get to check the boxes and feel like you've accomplished something that day. Because we all know being consistent is the most important thing. And it's when you are, um, most people are amazing for three weeks and then garbage and they take six months off. And like, that's just, you have to find a way to be consistent even during the days when things are crazy. So we built that into the system. I think the other thing that we've seen more often than not in clients is people apologizing and saying, but don't worry, next week, things should get back to normal. The the phrase, things should get back to normal, is like this pipe dream that we all live in. Like, oh, next week, things will get better. Oh, my kid is sick this week. Work is a little busy this week. Um, Oh, I have this extra project. But don't worry, next week in the future, things are going to be magically available and simple and life will be easier. It's like, there is no normal. Like the only normal is now. And that normal is probably chaos. So like accepting that (laughs) building acceptance now that like your normal is not normal. And that's normal. If that makes sense. Uh, It's, it's finding that, that getting through to people saying like, yes, like next week, another thing is going to explode. And the weekend after that, and the week after that, another thing is going to happen. So like, this is the normal. We have to find a way to make progress, even in the chaos. Because if we can do that, then when things, if there happens to be a, a day or a week when things magically line up, you're going to make a ton of progress, but you're going to feel confident that you can still make progress even when things are going absolutely crazy. Yeah, that is so huge, mate. Like, I think what you just shared there is like the most powerful, beneficial piece of kind of coaching or compliance advice people could 
could adhere to. Uh, we do something very similar in, in the program. We do a, a hell week. So like, you know, imagine your kids are sick, uh, the economy, you know, everything's going wrong. Uh, what can you still do that week? So we get them to think like, okay, this is this is a hell week. Uh, and it's usually like, like you were saying, like a quick walk for five or 10 minutes, a five minute workout, uh, like twice a week. Uh, and then we also look at like, look at last year, you got sick, you were stressed, your kids got sick, you know, whatever, traffic was bad. All of these things happened last year and they're going to happen this year. So like, if if that happens, what are you going to do? Or if then what? Uh, so it's, yeah, very similar to to what you were saying. And it's it's funny, I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Like every coach, ex experienced coach I've interviewed, they say very similar stuff, like do less and show up consistently. But then the narrative a lot of, a lot of time with the industry is like, push harder and restrict restrict harder and you don't want it bad enough so like why do you think like all the experienced coaches are actually saying similar to yourself but then a lot of the narrative that people believe or, or are told in the fitness industry is very much about that like push harder and you don't want it bad enough so what are your thoughts on that well i think incentives when it comes to the internet are dramatically different than what you might want for yourself so for the internet, everybody is competing for the same number of eyeballs. And the best way to stand out is to be outrageous or outlandish. And the best way to be outlandish or outrageous in the health and fitness space is to say things that haven't been said before. Generally speaking, that probably means saying something that is factually incorrect, uh, but it gets you eyeballs and it gets you a press coverage and it gets you making you feel like you're part of this new inside group that knows things that other people don't. And that's not necessarily the case. I think there are a lot of people that maybe use exercise uh, as a as an escape from dealing with other areas of their life that might not feel as great. And that can be mashed over with this machismo, go harder, push faster, um, push yourself even more, sleep is for the week. Uh, you know, just all of like this stuff that is like, you know, I imagine at if I was 22, and I heard that I would be like, yeah, man, this is, and this is awesome. Like this is, yeah, I'm hardcore. I'm like, I'm not hardcore, dude. Like I just want to sit on my couch and read a book and hang out with my wife and my dogs and watch a show on Netflix. Um, so I'm not hardcore and I have an audience of people that are also not hardcore. And that's totally, that's totally fine. Um, to, to bring this back around to, you know, the dichotomy you're speaking of, I think yeah. the, the hardcore people get the eyeballs. I'm guessing they don't necessarily maybe get as many results as they're after, or they get people who are already unbelievably intrinsically motivated and probably already in shape to get slightly more in shape. Like that does not necessarily appeal to me. I would much rather take somebody that feels like absolute crap about themselves and cannot relate to those people in any way and make them feel like they have saved their own life. Like that is so much more valuable to me and I think far more, um, far more enjoyable. Now, uh, to to bring to add one more point to this, you talk about you know we talk a lot about the these people needing to make small changes. I think there is we also really try to balance this at Nerd Fitness. We call it manageable. Um, what is it? It's manageable versus meaningful. So like a manageable change might be drink a glass of water every day. Is that meaningfully going to help you lose weight? Probably not. Is that meaningfully going to help you get stronger and, and feel better about yourself in the mirror? Like probably not, but it is a, that is a change. On the other hand, like a meaningful change would be cut your calories to, to cut your calories in half, increase your protein, go to the gym six days a week. Like, yes, you will see meaningful change. It's probably not manageable. So you have to find the right push and pull between, hey, we're gonna pick small changes but we have to pick enough changes so that you actually see a change either in the mirror or on the scale or with your performance so that you're excited that, hey, this is working and I feel motivated and encouraged and I feel like I have the confidence that if I continue down this path, I am going to continue to make progress. So it's really important to not just do the small change, but you have to pick small changes that are meaningful enough so that you also see progress. Otherwise, you know, it's just gonna result in people being frustrated that they've been drinking water, every day for six months and 
they haven't necessarily made any progress. Yeah, that's a really good point you're after making because the just go slow, go smaller, everything like that, it works, but you want to get people buy in as well and, and get that kind of a sense of excitement. So could you give maybe a few examples of, okay, you know, do more walking, drink more water on your really difficult weeks, but what are you kind of moving people towards? Like, I know you've done some GMB stuff, like uh, you've done some of their programs. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the, the guys at GMB. So like, I'm a, I'm a lead coach with them. And like, so a lot of the training I do is uh skill based and that from my point of view, it gets people very excited uh, if they've never done anything before. And now you're like, hey, you're working towards like a handstand and people are like, whoa, you know, this is actually very exciting rather than now you're doing, you know, five sets of 50, now you're doing five sets of 55 next week. So do you have any kind of skills or how do you kind of get that intrinsic motivation built into people so they get more buy-in and uh, compliance with their training or their nutrition? Sure. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's completely customized for each client. We have some clients who are literally working on, like working up the courage to call a therapist and to start working on their relationship with food. And we have other clients that are like, I'm training for a triathlon. So obviously the way that we speak to both of those clients is completely different. And each coach has been picked for that particular client because they have the same either nerdy philosophy or that client might want to learn a specific goal that that coach has a specialization in. So it's all completely dependent on the individual person. I will say that there is that exciting moment when people, generally speaking, people probably are Googling, I need a, a trainer because they're trying to lose weight. Not all, but most. And there's something changes during their experience with us where they shift from what does the number on the scale say to... I wonder what I'm capable of now that I'm starting to make progress. Or they say something like, I can't believe it, but I actually look forward to my workout now. And that's when the magic starts to happen. I think for many, it might start with the walk and, um, you know, uh, a walk and drinking, drinking water. It's like, Hey, that's a start. We're going to start putting more food on your plate, specifically vegetables and protein. Like, great. We're going to start there. Have you ever joined a gym? Do you have access to a gym? No. Great. Here's, let's try a workout at home. We're going to treat this as just an experiment. We're going to treat this as we're scientists. We are conducting an experiment. We'll see if we like this. We're going to try it for twice a week for the next month. And then I'll give you permission to stop if you don't want to do it. And again, more often than not, after a month, you're like, oh, I'm sleeping better. I feel better. I feel a little stronger. I didn't get winded walking up the stairs. That's interesting. I kind of like this. Let's keep doing that. But I really like this move. I hate the planks though. Can we take the planks out? No problem. We're not doing planks ever again. Instead, we're going to pick a different exercise. So it's a lot of communication and back and forth. And it's helping people in the way that they need to be spoken to and helping them find that thing, whether, whether it's performance. Oh, I'm trying to run a 5K or I want to get that handstand or, oh, that's interesting. Like turns out I can, I, I really like deadlifting. Like, what do I know? You know, we've had clients that have, a, a, a great woman named Joni who started found nerd fitness unhealthily at in her late fifties and is now a competitive power lifter and trains uh, people who are in their sixties and seventies to teach them how to start strength training. Like there's no, so there's cool. no limit on age. There's no limit on size. Like we help people where they're at and then help them find that thing that kind of flips the switch in their head that says like, oh, this is fun. I kind of want to do more of that. And that thing is something that makes them even healthier, stronger, faster, happier. And we just kind of double down. So it's a lot of exploration and keeping things fun. And then when we find that thing, we really kind of drive home, hey, that's fun for you. Let's keep doing it. Let's do more of that. Yeah, that's such a important point. In particular, like asking the client's you know, yeah, this is working, but like, I hate this movement. And it's like, yeah, great. We'll put in something that you don't hate because you're not going to repeat stuff that you hate. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, so I'd like to talk more about your, like, you've got 15 coaches. So obviously you started with yourself. How do you keep the, like, it seems very specific how you coach people, um, the approach you take from coaching. So like, is it, hiring people who've already come through as a client and then they become a, a coach with you or how do you or you just there's a lot of on the on the job training or like how do you keep the 
the nerd fitness team with such a big team of coaches now as well. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I wish I could say that I am a, a mastermind at this, but it, I would say it's my least, my least good skill would be management. Um, I literally demoted myself twice out of my own business uh, to focus back on the writing. So there was somebody else that runs the day-to-day -day of nerd fitness. There's another person who is head of head of coaching at nerd fitness. Uh, when it started, it was, I, I was just like, Hey, we have two people on the team that are certified instructors. And I think there might be a market for this. So like, I'll just send an email out to the nerd fitness email list and say like, Hey, does anybody want online coaching? This is at this point, eight years ago. And we got hundreds of people saying like, yes, I do. Like, oh, okay. Uh, quick. Uh, okay. Uh, fill out this application and you can pick if you want to work with this coach or this coach. And, um, and then we'll text you your workout program and we'll use an Excel document. So it was like very old school when we started. And then eventually it was, we used some third party software for coaching clients. And then we built our own and then it just kind of grew organically as, as far as hiring coaches, it was often referrals from other coaches. It was putting up applications on job sites or posting on, you know, working with, uh, we mentioned John Goodman, I think at one point years ago, he had his personal trainer um, and maybe still does his Facebook group. And we said like, Hey, look, we're looking to hire like five coaches in the next three weeks. Um, is it okay if we post here? He's like, yeah, no problem. Like, that'd be great. And we, we hired a few coaches out of, out of that arena. And the coaching philosophy has certainly evolved. And now there's like a coaching playbook. When a coach gets hired, they go through, you know, first of all, we, we make sure they have certain certifications ahead of schedule before even joining our team. Um, some of them are already on the nerd fitness list. All of them are nerdy, uh, probably nerdier than I am, uh, which is super fun. And then, yeah, they go through, you know, uh, I can't remember how much time it is. Again, we have a head of coaching who, that does this stuff um, who manages and, and teaches these coaches. This is how we interact. Here are some, we're going to get you into the software so you can see how it works. This is our philosophy for, you know, it, the how people eat. We have clients that are vegans. We have clients that are on Atkins. We have clients that are, you know, they, they come in with, this is how I'm trying to eat. No problem. We'll meet you where you're at. These are my goals for exercise and fitness. No problem. So really the coaching is, this is how we interact with our clients. These are the these are the cues that we look for when a client is struggling. These are the things that we say if a client starts to ghost us, um, you know, because they feel self conscious about missing a workout and they want to, they feel bad about missing it, so they hide. Uh, you know, online they hide. Um, these are the things and how we help people. These are the types of messages that we use. We're empathetic. We're supportive. We practice self-compassion. We help them develop self-compassion. So a lot of the training is around how do we communicate and how do we help people that are struggling? Because we already know our coaches have the, the credentials to build a workout program, to train and teach in nutrition. Like they already, they come in with those skill sets. Um, we then just help them with the, really the behavioral aspect of it. And then making sure that it can be done efficiently so that they can serve clients and make sure those clients feel like they're getting enough attention and that they're, you know, they're getting their money's worth. Yeah. With the self-compassion, do you use Kristen Neff's work or do you, what do you use? Like what type of um, mindset work or information around self-compassion do you use? Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a conglomeration of, of a number of things. Um, We've done a lot of uh, motivational motivational interviewing. Um, I believe that's the term. Uh, again, my, like my job, literally, I'm a writer and accidentally built a business and um, have just been fortunate enough to hire some amazing people that train and teach and coach uh, in this area so that I can focus on the thing that I think I'm uniquely qualified at. And that's writing funny things about helping people, tricking them into doing pushups and going for a walk every day. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think there's a lot of the compassion comes from, um, I think the specifically in the areas of like, oh, we've seen this in our own clients and we see the same type of self, uh, self-loathing messages repeatedly across our customer base or community. Like how can we best help those people? And when we start to help them and see that that works, like, okay, that then probably ends up in our playbook. Like if a client, um, is, 
you know, we're a big fan of um, the four tendencies of Gretchen Rubin. Um, she talks a lot about like, oh, some people might be an, an obliger or they might be a, a rebel. So like they, you know, if they're an obliger, then they will do whatever they can to please you and to make you happy as a coach. This other person as a rebel will do everything to kind of push back because they grew up in a military household or they grew up playing sports their entire life, always being told what to do. And now that they have freedom, they there's a part of them that always wants to push back. So it's it's been kind of fun to say like, oh, this is interesting, like combining all of these disciplines into helping people depending on their personality and, you know, accepting that some people might need a little bit of tough love, but most of us are pretty brutal to ourselves. So really what we need is to be kinder to ourselves. So that's the, it's, it's been a fun, it's been fun mixing all of these things together to help people identify that self-compassion and feel so much less guilty about missing a workout or eating McDonald's with their kid on a weekend. Yeah. And it's just, I guess, initially for people and for myself included, you might feel like you're being too easy on yourself, but then the, you know, it's, it's the all in all out mentality disappears once you're like, Hey, it's okay. Like you, you missed a workout. That's fine. Just do it tomorrow. Like it's not a big deal. Just do it the next day. Like, it's no big deal. Yeah. Versus like, no. <laughs> and then I need to gorge now to pacify myself. And you know, this pattern repeats. So, um, mate, like you've been around for a long time, you know, from the fitness industry. How, how old are you now? I'm 39. I yeah, old enough so that I had to roll. I had to put my. I had to look up and to the left as I remember what year <laughs> I was. Uh, yeah, thirty nine. But like writing on the internet since two thousand and seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Like it's a long time on the internet. Um, what would you say, if you were willing to share, would be your biggest failure, and what have you learned from it? I mean, I've made so many failures. Uh, trying to, I, I think I've made personal failures and professional failures. Uh, I think the personal failure is that I have lived a lot of that time. You know, I have workaholic tendencies. I'm a people pleaser and, and I want people to like me. So I have spent a lot of time probably focused on the wrong things. And I spent a lot of time burning myself out, telling myself, if I just work really, really, really hard for the next six months, then things will get easier. Or, oh, I just need to redo this, the whole site or rewrite all of these articles. I'll just get up at four in the morning and do it every day, seven days a week. And then things will slow down. I perpetually lived in the future. And as a result, I feel like I missed a lot of the present. So personally, I think those are mistakes that I've had to overcome and accept that just like we tell our clients, like this is like life is happening now. And what a shame to consistently live exclusively for the future uh, that may or may not exist. And as we know, I might work really hard for six months and then something else is going to fall apart six months from now. Um, I think professionally, the things I've done wrong, well, I've done a lot of things wrong. Uh, one, I, I spent a lot of time forcing myself into a role in my own company that I was not good at and didn't want to do and only did because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And that was be the manager of a 30, 40 person team, you know, and there was hierarchies and structures and um, staffed up real big and, and hired a lot of people to focus on a lot of things. And I was miserable. I hated it. My mental health suffered. I, uh, it was really, really dark place. I would say 2020, 2021, just like, dude, this is not fun anymore. I built this business myself and I built myself almost like, like, like building a brick wall and I'm putting the bricks and I'm playing, placing them individually until I noticed that I've like bricked myself into a corner or bricked myself into a position that I couldn't get out of. Oh man, this is not, this is not great. I'm, I'm unhappy and I don't want to work on nerd fitness anymore. So I made a really challenging decision two years ago to say like, I, I can't be the guy in charge of this. And I stepped back and said like, I'm going to get back to writing and doing the things that I actually made, gave me joy. And uh, it has led to some really enjoyable and exciting things. Like I said, I'm working on a project uh, that um, I, I can't, I can't fully talk about yet, but anybody could guess um, about writing 
And uh, I have felt more fulfilled and excited with that than I have in a long time. At the same time, like if I'm doing that, then the focus isn't on search engine optimization and marketing tactics at Nerd Fitness. So it's been kind of pulling me back in that direction. And that means that, you know, it's going to cause Nerd Fitness to evolve. And what does that look like for Nerd Fitness? And we're still figuring figuring those things out. But I've, uh, I, you know, I've made plenty of mistakes. I've learned a lot. I realized that like, that's kind of par for the course as challenging and difficult as it is. It's like, yeah, mistakes happen and you learn from them and then you do your best to fail differently the next time. And you take the lesson from that and you fail differently the time after that. And then you just kind of repeat this. Uh, there's that great quote. It says success is moving from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. Um, I have found that to be absolutely the case. And I had lost that enthusiasm for a, a number of years. And only recently, I would say within the past year or so, has it come back with full force. And it's because I'm finally doing the things again that I love, that I'm good at, that I'm uniquely capable of doing. And um, I'm just excited to keep going, kind of going down that path and seeing where it takes me. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, mate. Uh, it's interesting what you said about your business. Quite a few people I've talked to um, who would be very successful, like yourself in the industry, uh, to kind of said similar thing, like it got really big and then you went into the, a different role to the beginning and then it was like, oh, I'm not enjoying this anymore. And you've kind of created this prison within within the business. Yeah. In my own business, like <clears throat> I'm responsible, you know, it's mine. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to do any, I don't want to work on this this week. It's like, man, like, what do you want to work on? I was like, I want to write stuff. That's a good start. Why don't we get back to writing? And sure enough, as I, I'm writing these things and sending out the emails to Nerd Fitness and coming up with clever stuff and working on this project, I'm like, God, I feel so alive again in a way that I hadn't for years. It, it took me it took me five years to learn that because I was like, no, leaders push through the hard stuff and they just learn. And ultimately, I just got slightly less bad at being a manager and slightly less bad at being a leader while crippling my mental health and avoiding <laughs> not being able to do any of the stuff that makes me happy and is like the most probably like the best, the, the most important thing I could do for nerd fitness, I was not doing. Um, and now that I'm doing it again, it's like, oh yeah, this is why I got into this in the first place. And uh, I'm excited to see where that journey takes me and where I can, how I can further help the community in this way. Yeah, that's so good to hear, mate, that you're like, because when we jumped on today as well, I was like, wow, you've got awesome energy. You're like, let's chat, you know? So you're super pumped. Um, With, with the first point you said about personally as well, I'm curious because definitely, you know, myself personally as well, like it's like, oh, I need to, get to this milestone or I need to get this work done. So I'd love to hear like how you work through that kind of maybe perfection or work workaholism um, or like, oh, I need to redo this. And then in six months, like, you know, then it'll be okay. Like how yeah. have you worked through that? There's a great book by Oliver Berkman called 4,000 Weeks. It's called Time Management for Mortals. There's the subtitle. It's a book about quote unquote productivity and time management. But really, it's a book about living life. Uh, I realize that sounds as broad as possible, but I've probably read that book uh, four times. I think it's come out in, I think it came out in either 2020 or 2021. Um, it's my favorite book I've read of the past decade. And for somebody that does have those workaholic tendencies, that is, you know, I happen to be um, fortunate, but it's also a double-edged sword. Uh, some of my best friends are authors who have sold 15, 20 million copies of books. And uh, I, it's really easy for me to play the comparison game and to see all of the people, especially thanks to social media, you know, the, it's really easy to compare yourself against like literally the best in the world or the outliers or the exceptions to the rule. And then to feel unbelievably bad about yourself that you're not doing more and you're not, and uh, this book I found to be really helpful in slowing down and kind of, ex I would say like expecting less of myself, but really it was like, I realized I was playing life with the wrong scorecard 
and comparing comparing myself to people who were playing a completely different game than me. So this book comes along, the pandemic happens, nerd fitness explodes and it expands and I'm miserable. And I'm reading this, I'm like, oh man, like I realize, like I'm, if this works, this path I'm headed down, what does that look like? And like, if it worked, it meant a bigger team, more stress, more meetings, more, more, more. And I was already miserable at the level I was at, like more of that, if that was the the path I was on, more of that would have been uh, devastating for me. So it's like, that's not the ladder I want to be on. I want to be on this other ladder over here. And that's like, I'm a writer. I write and I help people with my words and I make them laugh and I help them think a little bit differently about their life. So I started to move back in that direction. I slowed down. I gave myself forget some forgiveness for not being even further along. And uh, that book really helped me to like accept that nobody has it figured out and we're all here for like the blink of an eye and we're all just trying to make the best that we can. So like finding ways each day to do something that feels meaningful. And for me, that's writing. If I write in the morning and I do a little bit of work on some other stuff, like that's a pretty good day. And if I can just do that more days than not, like I'm probably going to end up in an okay spot and things will be good. And my family and I can spend quality time together without me having those 4 a.m. all, you know, working 90 hour weeks or 100 hour weeks. Um, instead, it's like I work a decent amount, but I stop. And it doesn't consume my life like it had for the previous 12 years or 13 years. Um, it's been quite the journey. That book has been really profound and helpful for me. And uh, I would highly recommend anybody else that suffers from like this workaholic stuff or just can't seem to be present. Uh, that's a great place to start. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, mate. With regards to like boundaries or turning off, especially I'm guessing you, you, if you have so many clients and everything like that, uh, do you have any kind of rules like you've different phones or you've, you know, you don't, you don't check stuff until a certain time or after a certain time. Do you have anything around that to stay yeah. offline? Yeah. I mean, I have, I have rules. My life is governed by rules. There's another great book by Shane Parrish called clear thinking just came out. Um, but he talks about, he talks about rules as well. And specifically like people like make the decision once create the rule. And that way you don't have to make the decision every day for the rest of your life after that. So for me, you know, like I'm trying to wrap my day up around four o'clock. I start my day at eight and that's after waking up and taking the dogs out and making coffee for myself and my wife, um, making breakfast, et cetera. So I use programs on my computer called, uh, it's called Focus. It's like heyfocus.com. Uh, focus to block time-wasting websites. Mornings are for writing. Uh, interestingly, I actually used to have an assistant and realized that like I just... I like kept coming up with more work for the assistant to do. And the reality was like, dude, just like simplify your life in such a way that like you can handle it. So it's, you know, I use a calendar program to schedule and, you know, you reached out to me on Instagram and like, I was the one, I was like, yeah, like that sounds great, man. Let's do it. So I, I have the timer apps on my phone to say like Instagram shuts off after 15 minutes and I can't use it again. Um, I have those, like I said, on my computer to block websites. So I can only check them for a few minutes a day. And I find if like, if I'm in this office or what I'm trying to do more of, if I'm in this office and I'm at this computer, I'm working. And then I force myself to get up and leave. And I realized this was true. Like when I was struggling with nerd fitness, I would sit at this desk from eight to four and not really do anything. I'd poke around on Instagram or I'd poke around on jump in on a meeting and like, was just kind of like twiddling my thumbs and not really doing work. Now that I'm excited to work and I have these systems in place, it's no longer a challenge to get me to like stay focused. Uh, it's way more, it's easier for me because of those handful of rules and a little bit of technology, but mostly it's like, I'm just finally working on the stuff that aligns with what I'm trying to do again for the first time in a long time. Yeah, that's really cool, mate. <clears throat> because I guess it's must be a challenge in the sense that, you know, you could probably scale scale to the moon and then you're like, even more sad and depressed or down or overwhelmed. And it's like, well, yeah, it's just not my skill set. Yeah. It's just yeah. not what I'm, it's not what I'm good at. I, like I said, I'm a conflict avoidant people pleaser, which is an awful position to be in as a boss. Um, 
I, I just not, it's not my, it's not what I do. It's not what I'm good at. What I am good at, I, I was avoiding for a long time, even though that was the thing that got me to where I was. So it's like, why don't I just get back to doing that? And, you know, now it feels like, okay, this is, this feels sustainable, which I think is exciting. Like I could stick with this schedule that I have now for the next 40 years and feel like I'm not missing anything. It's like, I write for a few hours in the morning. I strength train four days a week. My wife and I take the dogs for walks regularly. I travel next week. I'm going, uh, my, my way we're heading to a friend's 40th birthday party. Um, like this feels sustainable in a way that I think even the way that I trained and lived in my twenties didn't feel sustainable. It was always just go, go, go push more, more, more. And I, I, healthier, mentally healthier than I've been in a long time. And a lot of that has just been through doing less, but, uh, if I realize I keep throwing books at you, there's another great book called effortless by a uh, Gregory, Gregory McCown McCown. I'm, I'm not, I'm probably butchering the poor guy's last name. Um, but it's like doing less better. And that's what I've tried to do is I'm doing way less. My schedule is empty. Almost. I record podcasts. I'll do a meeting a week. Otherwise it's like my focus is on writing and that's it. Like do that and do it so good that other people share it. And like, that's where my focus has been. That's where my focus is going to be. You know, I'd say for the next 40 years, ask me again in six months and who knows, but I hope, hopefully this is what I'm focused on because it feels, it feels right in a way that uh, things haven't felt right in a while. And do you think you would have gotten to the level you did? Like had you stuck to the writing or you know the way you went into the managerial role hiring staff and everything like that and and also push yourself very hard it seems over like the 10 or 15 years uh it's an i think i've heard tim ferris talking about this as well like do you think it, you kind of need to go through that and then come out the other end or do you think it would have been possible doing it kind of the sustainable way from the start i love that question uh because i think it's really easy for we all hear the people that are like i went to, you know don't go to college and like, Oh, where did you go to college? Like I went to Harvard. It's like, Oh, like, okay. Or Hey, like don't work so hard. And like, okay. Like, but you built your billion dollar business working really hard. Um, so I a hundred percent agree with you on that. I, you know, I don't want to say that like I did struggle with pushing myself a lot and I didn't miss a lot of life. So I wish I had done some of those things differently. I think there was definitely a mistake made when I stopped writing I think there was still a way that I could have written and kept the focus there and then used those, like built the business around, around those things. Because the reality is like, sometimes you hire people and they're focused on projects that like are just projects that are not effective for helping the business. And as a bad manager, um, that's happened to me a lot. And I don't think it's any fault of the employees. It's that I hired the wrong people or rather I hired for the wrong position because I didn't know what I didn't know. So I've made that mistake so many times um, that I've just consistently happened to learn more and more and more. So to, to bring it back to the, like, it's easy for a workaholic to say, like, just don't work as hard after I've had a, you know, a decent amount of uh, success, I suppose. Um, I think there's a way I could have done it without burning myself out and nerd fitness would have ended up in an even better spot. Um, but I wouldn't have the bumps and bruises and I probably wouldn't know what I know now. So I would have just encountered some other mistake down that path as well. And it could have gone even differently. So I, I often look back with regret and say like, I wish I had done things differently five years ago, but it's not helpful. So I try to give myself some grace and say like, you didn't know what you didn't know. Um, life happens the way that it did. You've learned some things and now you can take those lessons and help other people not make those particular mistakes, even though they'll probably go through them as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's interesting. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to open up this rabbit hole now because I'm conscious of your time, but the two of my buddies we were talking about like free will. Uh, there's a lot of, I think Sam Harris and Sapolsky have talked about that recently or the last few years. And it's, it's an interesting conversation. Like things are just, you know, you've no control over the path that you're on, essentially, um, is what um, Sapolsky argues in his book, which is it's an interesting concept, like you've no control. Yeah. So you just have to, I guess it brings it back to what you're saying at the start, like, enjoy the path that you're on, because you, you don't actually have any control over it. 
Yeah, I think it's fascinating, right? And I think we're even seeing yeah. it now. I mean, we'll, we certainly won't go down this rabbit hole, but the discussion <sighs> around you know these these weight loss drugs that um, have become like this big controversial third rail topic for people to discuss or not discuss. Like, I don't necessarily think humans are any different now than they have been at any point in the past. Like all of a sudden humans are not lazier. Humans are not, our biology isn't any different than we were a hundred years ago. What has changed is our environment and society has changed. So everybody that's like, just put down the fork, like that is so unhelpful to the, to a discussion around, you know, the, the, that food noise that so many people feel and you hear the stories of people that are on these weight loss drugs for diabetes or whatever it may be. And they're like, for the first time in my life, I'm not thinking about food 24 hours a day. It's not like they chose to think that way. It's something biological mixed with the environment in which we're in that has created this environment for people to overeat um, certain, certain foods. So I think, you know, that, that free will, you know, you're talking about people don't have free will. Um, I think it's really interesting idea. And I can certainly see that being true for a lot of people, for a lot of things. And I don't think it's a moral failing that people are overweight or struggling with their weight or can't get themselves to, to eat less. This stuff is hard, man. And we're all struggling with things. You know, I might not have a food addiction, but I certainly was a workaholic. I have other tendencies that, are championed on the internet for being hardworking, but like, maybe that's also bad. Like it certainly didn't help my mental health in many ways. So I think there's, I love that discussion. I mean, we could go for like four hours on that. We're not going to, but we could. Um, round two. <laughs> yeah. Round two. That would be, I mean, like yeah, yeah. that's, that's what's cool. fascinating to me. Like where my time goes now, it's not like studying the mechanics of a pushup. It's studying behavioral psychology and reading studies on that stuff. Like that's, what's so fascinating to me because humans are so complex and the world is chaos and we're all just trying to like get through the day, feel a little bit better about ourselves and, and take care of ourselves and our family. And like, that is, that is unbelievably challenging in this day and age. So that's the stuff that like, that's the stuff that gets me out of bed and gets me reading and exciting about or excited about uh, helping people is like, how do we help people knowing all of the things that we know now? That's fascinating to me. Yeah. Also, like, I just think in the US, you guys are, it's so conducive, as you know, it's proven with, with the statistics, like, it's very hard to walk. There's fast food everywhere. And like, I was actually talking to Ryan from GMB about this, because he's lived most of his life in Japan. I think he moved there when he was 21 or something. And now he's 50. He moved back to the US. I think it's uh, Kentucky, uh, or Kansas. Yeah. And uh we were talking, he was like, yeah, I, I drive everywhere now. It's just like in Japan, he used to walk everywhere. Um, and, you know, that compounded over decades, you're going to gain weight a lot easier than if you're moving in Europe, like we cycle everywhere. It's just the environment is much easier to slot in and just be more active. And then there's actually uh, infrastructure to walk. It's not just like a freeway <laughs> with cars. So you're going to get in a car. You're not going to walk. Yeah, it's brutal. I mean, it's it's so challenging. And like I said, we're not any different than we were. So saying that people are different now is, I think, a, a fallacy. I think, you know, it's like, oh, look at people back in the 50s. Look how much thinner they were. Well, yeah, but th this is the reality in which we live now. Like we need to treat people with tools that exist today. So I'm not going to speak for or against these medicines, but I think it's perfectly acceptable to consider them a tool in a tool belt for people to help them increase their all-cause you know, their, their, their length of life and their, their quality of life. Um, having those discussions with doctors, I don't think is a moral failing in any capacity. I think it's just the reality of the environment in which we live these days. And that's the environment in which we live. And that's like the, that's the journey that I'm excited to continually go down is like, how do I help these people where they are and make them feel not bad about themselves, but also help them teach them that they can change while also acknowledging that Free will might not be as free as we think. Uh, I think that's fascinating and love it. Um, and we'll continue. This is, you know, this is where, I, where I'll be spending the next decade of my life reading and thinking about. Very cool, man. So I just want to finish with one question. Um, what have you changed your mind on in the last two years, if anything at all? Uh, 
I mean, I think we've already covered the big one, which was like, stop trying to be somebody else and just get back to being yourself. Like I spent so much time, even when I was starting to write again, it's like, I don't remember how to do this. And I was like, what do I post on Instagram? Well, this is what other people are posting. So I started posting similar things. Like that doesn't feel right. And finally, when I started like being myself again and being goofy and weird and self-deprecating and, and helping people like not feel alone, like, oh, this feels right. But why don't I, why don't I just get back to doing this? So it's been literally a two-year journey of like refinding myself and refinding my voice and refinding how I can help people because I spent the previous three years not being myself and trying to shoehorn myself being a square be a square peg and try to shove myself into a round hole yeah that's so helpful man for, for myself personally and i'm sure for a lot of people listening as well oh it's so, so cliche like, too right like just be yourself but like it's so true none of us do it and like there's all yeah. the lessons i'm learning are like things i've already known and then i go to therapy and i'll talk to my therapist and he'll be like have you considered this yeah you're probably right I should probably just do the thing that I know I need to do that I've been avoiding because I'm afraid of it. Uh, that just happens repeatedly because uh, humans are weird and we have no free will. Yeah, D Dan John, he said like research. It's like you're researching for the answers you already know, which I thought was a, a nice way of putting it. Yep. Yeah, it's so, uh, life is weird. Here we are it's figuring it out. Oh. <laughs> Awesome, mate. So where can people learn more about what you do? Where's the best place to find your work and and coaching and everything that you guys offer? Yeah, nerdfitness.com. We're at nerdfitness is on Instagram and all over the place. You can learn about the coaching program there. Otherwise, I'm on uh, Instagram and threads. I've actually had a lot of fun. Threads kind of feels like social media to me circa 2011, 2012, where it's a bunch of creators and and writers and and people um posting their thoughts so i've actually had a lot of fun on there those are the two places to find me instagram and threads it's steve cam s-t-e-v-e-k-a-m-b um but otherwise just google anything nerd fitness or steve cam you'll we're pretty easy to find awesome man yeah i really enjoyed today and yeah it would be cool to do that round two uh if I free will in the future sometime i love it well once i have a, a certain um certain project that i can talk about well, we'll, uh, we'll have to do that round two Ah, oh, cool, mate. Awesome. Bye-bye.